the new decade that started in 1910 should have been the best of times. The world was beautiful, at least for some, and getting better for all. Society embraced modernity and the advances in communication, transportation, technology, and especially medicine promised a long and healthy life. Scientists began to unravel the secrets of matter, energy, space, and time. The last corners of the world were being explored and ancient civilizations brought back to life. Back in Europe, the royal houses were all cousins and the conflicts of the past forgotten, so peace was assured for centuries to come. The arts blossomed. Artists created masterpieces in a dizzying variety of styles, from neoclassicism to impressionism, expressionism, cubism, primitivism, constructivism, and more. In music too, the last great music of the post-romantic era was being written, impressionism reached its apogee, and newer, more modernistic styles were reaching their maturity. It is amazing that the three short preludes you are about to hear by Prokofiev, Debussy, and Rachmaninoff were all composed within a year of each other.
what ravishing music. But somewhere beneath the sensual beauty, do you hear the world weariness, the decadence, the darkness? These were already in the air. Even in this age of science, the harmless passing of Halley's Comet caused panic. One of the first motion pictures ever made was a horror film, Frankenstein, about a monster created by man. As 1911 unfolded, so did many man-created horrors. War came to the Balkans as Italy attacked Turkey. Mexico erupted in revolution. And in China, the empire that had spanned millennia was coming to an end. 1912 brought little relief. The troubles in the Balkans grew. In Russia, the seeds of future cataclysm were taking root. And even the pinnacle of technological achievement was destroyed by impersonal forces of cruel nature. Is it any wonder then that artists and musicians began to explore the darkness within? The great pianist and composer Ferruccio Busoni completed and premiered his most revolutionary piano work, the great Sonatina Seconda, in 1912. This piece was in part a working out of his ideas for his future opera, Dr. Faust. In the Sonatina, we witness the first part of the Faust story, a man both horrified and simultaneously seduced by the irresistible sweetness of temptation as he succumbs to his darkest impulses. The premiere of the work caused a riot in Milan. I have performed it many times, and I have found that a hundred years later, it continues to move and dismay the listeners.
as the year 1913 unfolds, Europe is still in peace. Russia celebrates the tricentennial of the Romanov dynasty. The royal family basks in the outpouring of love and support from their subjects, and they cannot suspect the terrible fate that awaits them just a few years later. In America, the Ford Company rolls out its first moving assembly line, bringing the promise of affordable luxury to all. In music, the most memorable event of the year is the premiere of Igor Stravinsky's new ballet, The Red of Spring, in Paris. With the gorgeous set design and costumes by the Russian artist Nicholas Rurik and the choreography of Aslav Nijinsky, and of course Stravinsky's transcendent score, this was the ticket of the decade. Instead, the theater erupts in the now famous riot, which may or may not have started as a publicity stunt gone awry. Or perhaps the revolutionary music, the untamed angularity of the dance, and of course the subject matter of human sacrifice were just too much for the audience. With our perfect hindsight, we know that only a year later, the world plunged itself into a world war which was human sacrifice on an industrial scale. The music, as it turned out, outlived its detractors. The movements you will hear are arranged for solo piano by Vladimir Liechkis.
in the June of 1914. A 19-year-old Serbian nationalist assassinated the Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria, and all the ancient hatreds and conflicts boiled over into what became a world war. All wars are hell, but this one was an order of magnitude more horrific. Modern weapons, poison gas, and finally, an attack on civilian ocean liner showed that no convention of civilized warfare still stood, and young men died, 20 million of them, and as many more wounded. As Alfred Edward Hausman wrote, here dead we lie because we did not choose to live and shame the land from which we sprung. Life, to be sure, is nothing much to lose, but young men think it is, and we were young. Too many artists died on every side. Those who lived captured and crystallized the horrors of war, but others turned their talents to a different kind of art. Picturing a dream landscape of another place and time, beautiful and unreal, with just a hint of darkness at its heart. Among these creations was Maurice Ravel's great wartime masterpiece, The Tombeau de Couperin. Ravel, the French patriot, was eager to go to war when it first started. In 1915, at the age of 40, he got his wish. He served as a truck driver tasked with transporting severely wounded soldiers from the front. He soon grew passionately opposed to the war. In this piece, he mourns the dead, dedicating each movement to a fallen soldier, but celebrates a time when France was at the height of its glory and the dance suites of the great Francois de Coubera enlivened the halls of the Palace of Versailles. This is Baroque music seen through wistful eyes, through a veil of suffering.
The Great War ended in 1918, with Germany humiliated and in ruins. Its monarch, Kaiser Wilhelm II, abdicated and fled to the Netherlands. The Russian monarchy was less lucky. Tsar Nicholas II and his entire family became victims, along with so many others, of the Bolshevik Revolution and the civil war that followed it. As if war's political upheavals and wholesale destruction were not enough, the world fell victim to the Spanish flu epidemic, which carried off at least 50 million people. But by the end of the decade, however, things began to look up. The epidemic had burned itself out. The world united to form the League of Nations, a body that would of course resolve conflicts peacefully to end war forever. In America, women finally got the right to vote. The economy hummed, jazz was in its heyday. The optimistic, exuberant, roaring 20s had begun. The horrors of the previous decades were over and the world could look forward to prosperity and peace. But we, with our perfect hindsight, know well that the world was rotten at its core, nurturing the seeds of even worse devastation to come. In the young Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin was rising to power soon to turn his country into a nightmare of repression, starvation, and murder. In Italy, Benito Mussolini was elected in 1919, and the Italian fascist movement began. In Germany, Adolf Hitler presented his National Social Program in 1920 to the German Workers' Party and renamed it the Nazi Party. All of them promised a utopia, at least for their own followers. As in all times, Artists so deep below the surface and did not share entirely in a general post-war euphoria. In America, Charles Tomlinson Griffiths, earlier an exponent of American Impressionism, wrote his masterpiece, The Piano Sonata, which combines not only the elements of many musical styles, from Romantic to Expressionist, but also the complex emotions of the composer and his work. It is the perfect piece, therefore, with which to end this program.
you enjoyed hearing familiar and unfamiliar music from this most fascinating decade. All the recordings featured here are from three recent CDs. If you would like to hear more, please go to svetlanabelsky.com or hold up your phone to the QR symbol on the screen.